Hello, my name is Glenn Hall, and uh, today is February 15th, 2021. We're having a big snowstorm here in south central Missouri. Temperature is minus 3, wind chill negative 17, and we've already received about 3 inches of snow, and I think they're expecting up to another 8 inches or 9 inches over the next 3 days. So quite a winter storm we're having. Today's um, video is called Trump's Work and the Hidden Feast. The Hidden Feast. Donald Trump, over his so far four years of presidency, has revealed that Satanists rule the earth. It's really mind boggling to consider everything that was revealed over the last four years. Uh, the pedophilia, the child sex trafficking, the drinking of adrenochrome, the satanic ritual sacrifices of children and others in order to get that adrenochrome, and the utter lawlessness of the men and women who are in power in the United States. The two impeachments of Donald Trump prove that beyond reasonable doubt. No matter what the evidence is, certain people always voted to impeach and to convict Donald Trump. It was utter lawlessness um, with respect to every principle of the law. So, Donald Trump revealed that Satanists rule the world and that most politicians are compromised in one way or another. We still don't even know to what extent a lot of these politicians are compromised or why they voted the way that they did and why they uh, relentlessly attacked Donald Trump over the last four years and why it's still really has not ceased. Now, I still believe that Donald Trump won the election. I believe that he is going to come out victorious even now. And I've discussed that in some previous videos. I want to focus on some other things today dealing with especially the uh, Christian support for Donald Trump. I think there's a lot of immaturity in the Christian camp that supports him, and I want to discuss that today. I support him because he is the anointed person to do what he is doing, and that is to destroy Babylon the Great, to destroy the satanic kingdom that has ruled the world for thousands of years. There's a lot of Christians, though, who believe that they, that we're going to begin to see a, a um, um, a great revival come, and then a great time of prosperity and a golden age in the earth with this thing called Nisera and Jesera that you will find lots of people talking about. It's a total, uh, it's going to be a total uh, redoing of our economic system of both the United States and the world. If you've, if you've been following Trump for a while, and if you have followed various patriots who supported Trump, you will have noticed that a lot of them, even though they call themselves Christian, still speak with defiled lips. You know, they'll, they'll use curse words very casually and speak in a very defiled way.
we have a lot of Christians, even today, Christian prophets and others, who are encouraging Christians to get involved in political office, uh, believing that that's going to make a difference. Well, let me tell you something. That won't make a difference until God does something very unique that will finally make the difference. I myself was a state legislator for three terms, ran in order to bring God's law into, um, into effect, to write and pass laws that would um, implement God's holy laws, to end abortion, to end this, um, the mad rush for homosexual rights, that has been going on now for over 30 years and other things like that. I found that I had almost no support from my colleagues who were, of course, Christ or uh, Republicans. The rhinos, Republicans in name only, have been with us uh, for a very long time. But there also has not been a vision even of, of the conservative Republicans and to implement laws that would make this a righteous society. One of the things I also learned as a legislator was that the flesh I was a Christian. I'd been a Christian for over 20 years. Uh, not quite 20 years, then 15, 16 years at that time. Um, one of the things I learned then is that although a Christian and although wanting to live a righteous life, I could still be tempted. Now, when you understand the, the blackmailing that's gone on with respect to our officials, you understand how grievous that can be. Fortunately, that never happened with me, and I didn't get into a situation like those that has caused the blackmailing, but could it happen? You know, sexual sin is a very um, easy sin to fall into, uh, especially for a young man in his 30s, who is suddenly very popular because he's uh, a legislator. So anyway, what I found is that the flesh is weak. And even though the desire was in me to do righteousness, the power to be absolutely righteous was not there. The second thing I want to discuss in this video is that today's church prophets are wrong about many things because they do not understand the time that we live in. They think that certain prophecies must still be fulfilled before Christ can come and set up his kingdom. Today you see many prophets who are uh, expecting revival. Well, how many revivals have we had? The Christian church is now 2,000 years old, and there have been many revivals. But none lasted. None remained. Governments remained evil. And here we are now, 2,000 years after Christ came, lived, and died, and we see that a satanic world government rules the earth. It's, it's mind-boggling how um, ubiquitous that rule has become. Consider Kim Trails. Every country in the world has had planes dropping 
all kinds of things over them to do who knows what weather manipulation um, perhaps the dropping of nanoparticles so that they become ingrained within our bodies there's been genetic man manip manipulation of our foods so that we can't even buy what God created for us to eat. And now we have a multitude of health problems among the people. Diabetes, too, is, is rampant. And there are so many others besides that. And then, of course, we've learned in the last few years about the worldwide sex trafficking and child trafficking of children kept in cages underground. You know, the things that we've learned are so evil, so diabolical, that it, it's enough to rip the fabric of our minds. So what, what has happened? We have been in the Battle of Armageddon, the battle for our minds. Will we make it? Will we prevail? Who ultimately will be the master of our mind? What do you think the push toward the singularity is? The push toward the hive mind? The push toward becoming plugged into the matrix? The push toward melding men and machine of artificial intelligence taking over our minds? That's the battle of Armageddon. And there are people out there who have been pushing for that to totally occur by the year 2030. And the name Ray Kurzweil comes to mind. And he wrote a book that was published in 2005 called The Singularity. The Singularity is when man and machine become one. We will have no freedom if that happens. And for those of you interested, look into what's happening today with respect to vaccinations and how that ties into that and with respect to 5G and how that ties into that. So revival always fails and yet the prophets of today, they're always talking about a great revival coming. One of the things that the prophets do not see they're still looking for this great three-and-a-half-year tribulation at the end of time. The reality is that we have been in tribulation for thousands of years. When John wrote the book of Revelation over 1,900 years ago, he said that he was a partner with us in the tribulation. Also, when you consider history, evil men, have ruled through the entire 2,000 plus years of history. That includes popes and kings. Who was always persecuted by the popes and the kings and the religious rulers? The people who wanted to live a righteous life. The people who really just wanted to have a relationship with God and live their lives. But if those people did not submit to the powers that be, to the religious and political powers that be, they could not buy or sell. So they were forced, really, to take the mark of the beast or die. And many of them chose to die. Donald Trump's actions have revealed the man of lawlessness. Here's another thing that the prophets, the church prophets, have not seen. Now, I'll just I'll mention Mark Taylor here. Mark uh, preaches against the 501c3 and against the church prophets in a very strong and powerful way. And I commend him for that, and he's exactly right. I've been saying that for decades. 
As an attorney, I counsel churches never become a 501c3. 30 years ago, counsel churches to tell the people where the politicians are, tell the people who uh, who the pro-abortion politicians are and who the evil politicians are. And churches wouldn't do it because they went to other attorneys who said, no, you can't talk about political things in the church. See, that's that is putting, when a church failed to speak truth to their people, the state was their sovereign and not God. So Mark Taylor is exactly right in that a 501c3 organization, a church, will always fail with respect to implementing anything concerning God's righteousness in the earth because they are under a satanic system. They have submitted to a satanic system. Trump's actions revealed the man of lawlessness. Look at what people did to him, said about him for his entire four years and even now. We have seen lawlessness on display Ultimately, what we've seen is that each of these people, and that includes us, you and I, until we repent. But until that time, each of us declares in our hearts, I am God. And I will do as I will do. If I want to impeach you, I will impeach you regardless of the evidence. If I want to convict you in the Senate, I will convict you regardless of the evidence. If I want to slaughter a child so I can drink her blood and enjoy the feeling, I will do that because I am God. This is the man of lawlessness. And each one of us are that man until we repent. Until we repent and until we accept Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior. That describes us. That man is each of us until we repent of the kingdom of darkness and admit that we cannot be holy by our own strength, and must believe and accept Jesus' work for us. Now that reminds me of something very important to say. We must not add to or subtract from the Word of God. One of the ways that you can always know a false prophet is that the false prophet will fail to define sin. So he subtracts from God's word because he will not preach the law of God. I once approached a pastor, a good, a good teaching pastor, and, and said, uh, why don't you ever teach about God's law? And he said to me, because the people are too cranky to hear it. I'm sorry. The people have to hear it. To the law and to the testimony, Isaiah says in chapter 8, or there is no light in you. We must speak according to the law and according to the testimony, according to the historical truth of Jesus Christ. So we cannot subtract from the word of God. And you have many churches who just who do things the way that they, they do without even considering what the Old Testament might say about their ways of doing things, like worship, for example. Just read the book of Psalms and know that you are free to use musical instruments when you worship God, for example. All churches, though, I, I'm not, I don't want to just pick on one because I, I want to pick on all of them. 
all churches have defined their boundaries. You know, God would move the people of Israel in the wilderness, a place at a time. He would, and he would stand guard at that place. But when he moved, when the pillar of fire moved, the tabernacle had to move. The people had to move. When the Holy Spirit moves, you have to move. And if you're not willing to move when the Holy Spirit moves, then you're no longer with God. So that's a word for the entire church, the entire system of the churches that we see. But there's also the problem of adding to the word of God. I've recently uh, come across some of the New Age preachers who are preaching righteousness. And that has surprised me to hear a New Age preacher preach righteousness. I've not heard him specifically condemn a particular sexual lifestyle. But he might. However, he goes way beyond God's word because under his definitions of righteousness, we now can only eat uh, certain things in order to be considered righteous and in order to continue to climb in our ascension to be uh, to have the Christ consciousness. So beware of those who will take from or add to the word of God. A great truth and a great reality to understand here is that man cannot live perfectly in his flesh. The greatest example in the scripture that I can think of is David. David is called a man after God's own heart, commended by the Lord throughout scripture, anointed by God with amazing prophecies and amazing songs and psalms. And yet David killed his best friend because he sexed his wife and made her pregnant. David, what more heinous thing can you do than to kill your best friend? And under the law, adultery is a capital offense. Now, what's the answer to this dilemma that we find ourselves in? Now, here's where I begin to discuss the hidden feast of Scripture. The hidden feast, really more hidden even than I have considered. It's the, it's the feast of second Passover, but really... The Feast of Passover is hidden. You know, I, I didn't even realize until I had been a Christian for 20 years or 21 years that instead of celebrating Easter, I should be celebrating Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And did you know that Easter, Easter is when they celebrate the crucifixion of Christ, right? Well, did you know it's not even often at the right time of the year? It's off by a week often? Jesus was crucified on Passover day, the 14th day of the first month of the year. He was crucified 
as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was the Passover sacrifice. And yet, early on in the history of the church, and even in the King James Bible, the word Easter occurs, but it's really the word Pesach, which is Passover, in the original Greek. From, from almost the beginning, the church changed the whole idea of Passover. And they named it Easter. What is Easter? Easter is Ishtar, a pagan goddess. The church has been corrupt for practically the entire 2,000-year history of the church. So here we are now. We're at the, we're at the end of 2,000 years. The church hasn't even understood the most basic feast of God, which is Passover. And yet, when you go to most churches, you really often only hear one truth, and that truth is Jesus Christ died for your sins. Well, the reality is he died for the sins of every man. Okay? And if you read the scripture, Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2 come to mind, to leave the elementary doctrines of Christ, but yet most churches only teach on the elementary doctrines of Christ and don't even fully teach those. But there is a hidden feast. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. See, David is said to be one who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, even though he did what he did with Bathsheba. In the first year of Hezekiah's reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Notice it's in the first month. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. To consecrate yourself means to sanctify yourself or set yourself apart as holy. So Hezekiah is commanding the priests who should know better to sanctify themselves and carry the filth from the holy place. What is the holy place? The holy place is inside the temple. Prophetically, the holy place is inside your heart. Prophetically, this is applying to us because Levites are the priests and we are told in the New Testament that we are a royal priesthood. But this royal priesthood, this Christian priesthood has become defiled. This Christian priesthood has become filthy filthy. And it's at the first month. It's at the time of Passover. It's at the time when we should be ready to partake of the Passover. Because you have to be clean according to the law when you partake of Passover. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. Our fathers have been evil. 
Our church fathers have been evil. Our church leaders have been evil. Our church leaders have partaken of the satanic system that has ruled the world. Some of them have been leaders within that satanic system. Some of them are leaders now. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore the wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. Isn't that what we are? They're calling for the arrest of all the people who went to Washington, D.C. to see Donald Trump on January 6th. Calling them rioters and insurrectionists. And yet they're the most peaceful people in the country. The wrath of the Lord has come upon us. He's made us an object of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not now be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him and to be his ministers to make offerings to him. God has chosen us to be his ministers. God has chosen us to sanctify ourselves, to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness before him. We cannot call ourselves patriots and continue to curse, continue to use the Lord's name in vain, continue to do things saying that God approves it when it's clearly something that he has defined as evil. So here we are at a time when we are expecting God to turn things around. We are expecting God to put Trump back into power so that we can begin to see good things in this country again. But we're not ready. We're not ready. That's why there's this delay. We need to repent. We need to stop partaking of the things of the world. We need to quit going to their parties. We need to quit going to their uh, entertainments, especially their movies and their defiled uh, NFL Super Bowl game. They perform satanic rituals right in front of our faces, and we partake of it. It's time to stop. It's time to have nothing more to do with the things of the world. It's time to live a life of consecration unto God. A time of living a life of holiness unto God. Well, chapter 29 of Second Chronicles continues with this cleansing of the house and describes the cleansing. And, and I would suggest that you read through this I think it's interesting when we get to verse 25 of Second Chronicles 29. 
So Hezekiah stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. So prophets here are directing the king, Hezekiah. Likewise, true prophets of God need to be the ones who will direct and lead any of the leaders in government that is coming up. It's not enough for someone just to run for office and think that they can do better than the last guy because before long, we will be in the same situation that we're in right now, which is one of utter defilement and with Satan ruling the world. This has to stop. How does it stop? I'm coming to that. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. The burnt offering is ourselves. We offer ourselves a living sacrifice unto God. And when the burnt offering began, the song to the Lord began also, and the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of King David of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeter sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So as we offer ourselves a living sacrifice, we rejoice before the Lord. We make a joyful noise to the Lord any way that you can. Symbols, crashing symbols. Trumpets, lyres, harps, guitars, piano, any way that you can. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. And Hezekiah, the king, and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. So they're singing the psalms. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worshipped. And then they consecrate themselves to the Lord and bring more offerings to the Lord. And then we come to chapter 30. Passover celebrated. Passover. Let's read about this. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover of of the Lord, the God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time, that means at the first month, because the priests had not consecrated themselves in sufficient number, nor had the people assembled in Jerusalem. And the plan seemed right to the king and to all the assembly. What's this? Celebrating Passover in the second month? Is this lawful? Well, it is. In fact, let's go to Numbers chapter 9. Numbers 9, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. Remember, right, it was when they sacrificed the Passover lamb when they were in Egypt, that that very night they were forced to flee from Egypt. So Moses says, or the Lord says to Moses, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time. That is the first month. On the 14th day of this month, the first month, at twilight, you shall keep it at its appointed time. According to all its statutes and all its rules, you shall keep it. We need to go back into Exodus to read about all the rules. So Moses told the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And they kept the Passover in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at twilight, in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So the people of Israel did. Hezekiah and his people could not celebrate it at that time because the priests were not ready. They were not consecrated. They were not clean. And the people were not ready. They were not even there. Verse 6, 
of Numbers 9. And there were certain men who were unclean through touching a dead body so that they could not keep the Passover on that day. So they're there, but they can't keep the Passover. They have to wait a certain amount of time until they're clean. And they came before Moses and Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, We are unclean through touching a dead body. Why are we kept from bringing the Lord's offering at its appointed time among the people of Israel? And Moses said to them, Wait, that I may hear what the Lord will command concerning you. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If any of you or your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month, on the fourteenth day at twilight, they shall keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it until the morning, nor break any of its bones. According to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. So do it exactly right. According to all the statutes of Passover, but if you were unclean on the first Passover, partake of it at the time of the second Passover. Now it's been 15, 16, 17, 17 years ago that I became very ill right at the time of Passover and we intended to um, to have a Passover feast. And uh, I actually had a really serious infection in my leg and I was in the hospital. And it came to me, the thought came to me that I was unclean and I couldn't partake of the Passover. And then I remembered the scripture and suddenly God began to reveal a, a new understanding, a new doctrine. And that is that all of us are unclean through touching a dead body. That dead body is our flesh. We all live in the flesh. We are all carnal. We all touch a dead body. And you know what that means? We cannot partake of first Passover. Well, <clears throat> obviously, in one sense, we do partake of first Passover because when we believe in Jesus and accept and receive the reality of his sacrifice for us and the reality that he has cleansed us of our sins and that he has brought us new life in the Spirit, we partake of first Passover. And then there's also the second aspect of those who cannot partake of first Passover. Those who touch a dead body, but also those who are on a far journey. We've all been on a far journey. We have all walked in the wilderness in the scripture, you'll see, as you read it, that that wilderness that Israel walked in for 40 years was called the wilderness of sin, S-I-N. I always thought that was kind of strange, that the wilderness was called the wilderness of sin. But that's what we've walked in. We have walked in the wilderness of sin. We sin. Our flesh sins. We can't help it. Sometimes. Sometimes. We want to do what's right. Paul said, I want to do what's right, but, but I can't sometimes. Okay. We walk in the wilderness of sin because we touch a dead body, our carnal body, our carnal flesh. And therefore, because of that, we cannot be perfect. 
And so now we live at a time where we need to see we must be perfect because we cannot continue to live in a world that is totally controlled by Satan. We cannot continue to live in this defiled environment. He is about ready to destroy everyone. Either get plugged in to the machine and become his servant or die. That's where we are. We are at the Red Sea. We are there. See, and that's what the prophets don't see. The church prophets don't see. They think that there's things that need to happen yet. No, there isn't. We're there. And now it's time for God to act so that flesh will survive. Jesus said if he didn't come when he comes, no flesh would survive. And that's where we're at. We don't have long left. If the evildoers remain in power, no flesh will survive. So those people who realize that they can't do it in their own flesh that they can't live perfectly in their own flesh, who, lit, who realize that they have been on a long journey of sin, in the wilderness of sin, but they're ready to experience Passover now, the true Passover, then that time is at hand. Moses is a picture of this. Do you ever wonder why Moses died, had to die in the wilderness? Why he couldn't go into the promised land? Moses was the most faithful man in Israel. And yet, he couldn't make it. He couldn't make it in the flesh, see? It's a picture of not being able to make it in the flesh. Even Moses got angry one day and struck the, the uh, rock twice. And the flesh failed. God kept him out. What's a picture of us? We don't make it. We can't make it in the flesh. We're not going to bring in the kingdom of God in our flesh. We can't do it. That's the point of second Passover. We, second Passover is the glorification of the sons of God. So let's close this out by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. That's Adam. The second man is from heaven. Jesus. There's only two men. The man of lawlessness and the man of God. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Let me read it again. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, 
and the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. We are almost there. We have been on a long journey. We have touched a dead body. But now we understand that. Now we want the holiness of God. Now we want the righteousness of God. Now we want the rule of God and not the rule of men. What did God say when the people of Israel demanded a king? They got a king, just like the kings that we've seen for thousands of years. A king who tried to kill David, who killed many of his Levite priests when they provided David and his men with some food. Yes, we've had kings just like that. So, the time is at hand, but it looks different than what we're being told by most people. We are about to see the kingdom of God come. But remember what I just read. Flesh cannot enter the kingdom of God. The glorification of the saints of God. The glorification of the Kodeshim is at hand. And it will be those people who rule and reign on the earth very shortly. Amen.